usually how I like to to start these conversations is is really about an individual's journey. And you and Ethnotech is really one of the originals, man, that, that I covered on, on Cause Artist. <laughs> uh, you guys have been yeah. over a Thank decade you, now. You, over yeah, a decade. You've been back now. in us since the beginning. <laughs> Thank over, you, dude. It's uh it's an incredible to to finally get to chat, man. I'm so glad we get to chat now that we've had 10 years of, of this and we talk about a lot of different things. But uh, for those who don't know, kind of dive into the journey of Ethnotech, uh, how it started and what, what's it about? Yeah, sure. So um, Ethnotech uh, cr- collaborates with artisans in Ghana, Guatemala, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam by combining their traditional handmade textiles with our high-tech laptop and travel bags. And uh, I initially got the idea from uh, I was living in Vietnam. My wife and I were living there 2005, six. I was designing bags for another brand called Crumpler. And uh, there's, I was there full time and there's a lot of national holidays. And on one of them, I took a, a solo motorbike trip through the Northern Highlands where I um, connected with some uh, Hmong communities there uh, that create these amazing handmade textiles. And being a bag designer at the time, I was super inspired and wanted to find a way to combine them with uh, bags in kind of a customizable way. Um, and, and I hadn't really seen these types of traditional textiles on high tech, like waterproof bags. I've seen them on kind of like the right. tourist market fall apart in a week or month kind of thing. Right. Um, and so just kind of jotted the idea down in my journal at that point and then just tabled it for three or four years um, until I was back stateside and working another job for another bag company and then finally decided to uh, kind of go for it on my own. I felt I had learned enough and been close to the founders of both of those business who taught me kind of the ins and outs of running a soft goods business and uh, wanted to give back and do something unique and went for it and launched the business in like 2011. Amazing, man. Uh, so when you made that decision, did you go back to some of the communities that you met and, and spoke with them? Were they, were they doing their handmade textiles for companies as well? Or they were just doing it for themselves and, and just selling it at flea markets and stuff like that? Like, did you have to go to them and be like, hey, would it be okay if we like created these bags with you? Right? Like, was it foreign to them or, or they were sort of ready to go from day one? Yeah, the, the, I mean, they're pretty ready to go from day one. So like it's been in the, their culture for, for centuries and it's it's something they do on their free time. So agriculture is their primary source of mm, income. Gotcha. And so, you know, in between harvest or on, you know, in their free time, they're creating these textiles. And uh, one Hmong woman weaves or embroiders two skirts per year. And we actually make uh, at least the Hmong textile products are made from upcycled tribal skirts. Hmm. And so they actually usually you know, these days sell them at tourist markets. So across the highlands, you know, there's quite a few tourists that like cruise through there. And so um, there's a market when tourists are around and, Mm -hmm. you know, that's usually like a one-time purchase and done kind of thing. I do know that some of them work with other companies, but I don't know really in what capacity. So it's not like we revived an entire industry by any means. But yeah, I did return um, after the first year to Vietnam, mainly because I had a connection there. A friend of mine uh, started his own uh, sewing factory at the same time I was launching Ethnotech. And he and I got along a lot and, you know, wanted to support each other in some capacity down the road. And that was our opportunity. So got um, some interest from REI in the U.S. I don't know if you know that, that mm-hmm. uh, outdoor sure. store. Oh, yeah. And that was kind of the the big wake up call for, OK, it's getting serious <laughs> now. I need to get back to the back to the roots, back to the factory um, so that I, it can be like super hands on. And my wife was had already moved back there as well. And she was teaching kindergarten at the time. And, and so I stayed, stayed with her and um, yeah, came full circle. <laughs> you said you were in the industry before that. What were some of sort yeah. of the takeaways that you learned from that, that made you confident that you can go out on your own, right? And start something like this. So I think some of the takeaways were uh, at, the, at the first brand I was designing bags for, they had a really cool model where they had distributor meetings uh, every mm-hmm. year where they would bring all of their key customers to Vietnam and it would be up to us designers to pitch our own designs to sell the distributors on the upcoming collections. And so they involved their designers kind of from the ground up from a sales perspective, costing perspective. And, uh, you know, it's not just design something 
for you, you know, you have to learn about the customers and their markets and design it for them at the end of the day. And so that was a really good exposure. And then they even took it all the way to, um, uh, at least I had the experience and a couple other designers to, to work in a shop where the bags are sold mm. at, in Germany, in Cologne, Germany. So that really took it, you know, I got, got to see everything hands-on because I was, I was used to being in the sample room and close to the factory production side, but then they brought us all the way to the front end, the retail side, the distribution side. So learned a ton in a very short amount of time in that regard. And so having some exposure to sales and marketing um, not just being, you know, behind the scenes mm-hmm. designing product mm-hmm. that way. And then in the other, the other company, um, I got to learn more about like the pricing structure, margin requirements, and packaging design. And so between the two brands, I kind of was exposed to all aspects of how to run a soft goods That's business. Great. And so, yeah. And, and uh, the one company was very retail distribution focused while the other was also had a little bit of that, but was primarily e-commerce and e-commerce is something I didn't really know a lot about SEO, anything like that. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. that was quite a rounded experience. And I'd actually never intended to start my own business. I, I was inspired by that. The second brand I worked for in LA and, and I was like, you know, like I'm super inspired by, you know, I had that idea in the back of my head the whole time around handmade textiles and helping revive these, some of these traditions through modern bag design. And so I just kept getting more and it just kept coming into my mind more and more to, to at least scratch that itch. And so, you know, I, I, it, it, it affected the way I asked questions. And so I asked, you know, everything that came to mind on, you know, how does it work from the factory? What is like shipping and logistics? You know, what is margin markups and all these things. And so it was like, you know, I didn't study bag bag design in, uh, in university. I don't even know if they offer that as a course. I was about to say, as you're saying this, (laughs) you got your, you got your master's degree. Right. From, yeah, right from exactly. just like doing it and being on the ground and, and learning and asking the questions. I think it's such a great point because sometimes we want to just start things and, and sometimes you just need to start things, right? That's how you learn. But there's totally. there's always different avenues to to build something, right? And create something. And one is to just be in it on the ground with other companies doing it. You know, you could take bits and pieces of what they do you know, when you're ready to start, you kind of have the education of, like you said, how margin works, like price points, manufacturing, all these different things. And then there's little bitty sprinkles you can, you know, flavors you could put on it yourself, right? To, to make the system better or make it unique. So I think it's, exactly. a, it, it's a great uh, story to, to mention that there's not one path. You don't just have to jump in. You know, if you can find a way to kind of do a, a master's degree on the job, so to speak, right? Like go take four years and just get in the industry, right? And learn the basics of, of whatever industry you're in, right? It's such a, it's such a valuable thing. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's, that's, in my opinion, that's where real innovation comes from mm-hmm. is, I mean, you can be too early for something if you, if you do something radically different. And then it's, and then the, and then the market just isn't there, you know, like consumers like, uh, I don't know what that right. is. And I don't know if I want to pay money for it, but if it's an evolution, if it's a really smart and useful evolution of something that already exists, that's an evolution of that, or feels similar to something that they already use or interact with, that's when, that's when real innovation can, can take place. And so I think per, most companies reverse engineer a lot of either when they start out or still in their product development, you, you look at your competitors, you pick it apart and you say, okay, how can we do better? Or how can we make it our own way? And so like, I, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and, and they, they get overwhelmed about that. You know, they get, they have so many ideas and they're like, I don't even know where to start. And like, how, right. how can I be different? And there's so many people are like bigger than me and better than mm-hmm. me. And it's like, yeah, okay. So pick, pick a handful of companies that you think are really, really doing a great job of it. You know, pick a ultra premium one, pick, you know, a mid market mm-hmm. one and a mass market one, and then, and then list what they do well at their strengths and also list their weaknesses and then pinpoint somewhere in that matrix where you fit into it, how you can be different because you don't want to be in a red ocean where you're competing mm-hmm. one-to-one on features. You want to be radically different or at least different enough to where someone asks you, okay, so why should I care about your brand or your product or your service? Um, and then you just say something very simple and it's because no one else is doing that and, and you have a much easier time. Um, so the work is up front in doing that reverse engineering, but also having your main priority is the question to yourself, how am I different? How can I be different? Speaking of sort of innovation, I wanted to get your thoughts on on this because there has been a really cool and interesting revolution or, or just 
it, it's it's becoming more and more um, mainstream is making textiles out of plastic waste right from the ocean or, or from you know dump sites just just trying to corral the plastic and you being in in indonesia and around east asia and they you know they seem to have a issue with sort of you know garbage ending up in the ocean and, and, and just different waste problems have you seen have you been sort of looking at the ability to do that i know there are brands out there they're doing that is that something you think Ethnotech might do in the future? Have you looked into it? Like, what are some of the pros and cons of doing that? Is it super difficult to get into for, you know, a smaller brand? You kind of got to let the big brands do it first so they can innovate and, and find the structure to make it reasonable for more smaller brands to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I there's kind of two sides to it. So like Ethnotech, you know, we we have the tech fabrics or those are the machine made, high tech, waterproof, super lifetime warranty, durable fabrics. Yep. And then there's also the the traditional handmade textiles. And so uh, some of the weavers that we work with, uh, primarily in India, they have been doing, they, they weave some rugs made out of upcycled single use plastic mm. that is basically cut by hand with with a pair of scissors to create strips, individual strips. Mm. And then they, they do the same process as they do with cotton. They make warp yarn and weft yarn out of it. And then they they weave it the same way and it has its own its own vibe and uh, we we haven't we haven't gotten too much into that on the artisan side of things they're they're open to it they're open to trying new things they love the idea of their traditional uh, craft and culture evolving in a, in modern applications and so they're they're super excited especially the younger generation about seeing their 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 um, family's textiles on a pair of shoes or a backpack in our yeah, case that's cool but we do we do work with um, upcycled materials on the tech waterproof bag body side of things so like a lot of our most of our collection of bags right now are made out of 100 percent recycled pet plastic bottles gotcha um which seems to be pretty mandatory these days um, yeah. a lot a lot of brands are doing it and it's it's the right thing to do you i mean i think you I think you kind of have to, especially if the market is demanding it. And I think that's a really good trend if the market is demanding it. But at the same time, you know, there is a bit of, there's a bit of uh, storytelling going on there because I, I, I do know from being in the industry that though it's made out of recycled plastic bottles, mm-hmm. it does have a much larger carbon footprint than yep. let's say um, virgin nylon polyamide textiles. So those are really efficient and they last longer. And so they break down and end up uh, in landfills less likely or um, um, than, than, the, than the recycled um, yarns and uh, consu- usually consume a, a lot less electricity and water and whatnot. And so so uh, it's kind of the case of two rights, um, you know, both have their virtues. It just depends on what kind of story you want to tell or what kind of story people want to read into or subscribe to. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's interesting. We, there, there's always even there's pros and cons to everything, right? Even when you're trying, even when you're trying to do something positive, it still could have these negative, not really side effects, but just just negative installments of what goes into it. Right, which you, you don't sort yeah, of think of. Yeah. You're so kind of focused on let's get this plastic out the ocean. Let's you know make this or let's let's do something to solve this problem. Right, mm-hmm. but it, it also might create you know an unforeseen issue that that could have its adverse effects too. So so yeah, I mean it's yeah. such a it's such a difficult a difficult thing to process sometimes. And I think going back to to what you said, it's just kind of look at the market. You know, take what you think people are doing really well and figure out a way where you can fit in with some, you know, originality, right? Maybe find a way to have that process be carbon neutral, right? Or eventually carbon negative mm-hmm. or something like that. Then that will yep. sort of shift the, you know, the the idea that that, that process can can be, you know, sustainable in, in some way. I wanted to kind of yeah. um, chat about the different, you know, areas because you had mentioned uh, Vietnam, um, but you're also working in Ghana, Guatemala, India, Indonesia. How do how do you come to know these sort of new, you know, artists and, and villages? Do do they reach out? Does somebody reach out? Uh, do you kind of just mm-hmm. go and do and you, and build relationships? How how does that part work? Where you build out like sort of this global network of artisans? That all came with a lot of upfront research that I did mm-hmm. um, beforehand because I wanted to I wanted to have a diverse collection of textiles, regions, and styles to offer. Because at the end of the day, like it can't be a long-term sustainable thing if it doesn't sell. Like there's a symbiotic mm-hmm. relationship between the artisan's work and 
the end customers who end up buying it because that's all we do. Like we're the bridge. Like if anything, we're of service to the artisan to, to take what they do and connect it with mm-hmm. an end consumer. So making a, kind of a judgment call based on my design experience on what I think will sell, what people will like, and also what is the maximum impact we can have. So I did some research on countries and their textiles and and some of the regions that had, you know, still a lot of local demand, but still a lot of room for, you know, reviving something and scaling it. So to so to have an impact. And so uh, just just started learning about textiles. I went to the public library and 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 started reading and uh, bought a, a quite a few Lonely Planet travel guides to see where um, you could you could travel to in some of these countries to visit artisans and uh, kind of deducted it down to you know a couple areas in Central America, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and um, and and eventually you know it it came down to a quite a diverse collection of aesthetic and also came down to three main techniques. One is like handmade batik. Uh, which is wax wax resist dyeing, and then uh, traditional loom weaving and embroidery. And so I felt like that was a that was a good three tiered approach. And the countries that I had selected, um, the ones that you just listed, I think we're going to be exciting to work with and highlight. And and I felt we could do good work there. So just started, you know, dialing phones and sending emails to try to. Uh, make connections and then eventually you know got to the point where it looked like it would would be promising but still difficult to kind of communicate online and then just visited each 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 of them to establish uh, an in-person relationship and then after doing that and kind of clarifying what our intentions were and Mm -hmm. that we don't want this to be a one-time and done thing and more like a a long-term relationship where we buy every every three months for the next 10 20 years um and once they understand um kind of the the long-term vision and where they could fit into that and the the my intentions for for the business and our collaboration that that was that was everything so going there in person Mm -hmm. uh, really makes all the difference yeah that's huge what was that experience like when when you do that what what is kind of take us take us there if you will right when because we're we're so (laughs) we've been so uh so travel um restricted for so long we kind of forget what yeah, it's like to yeah. connect with people in different cultures and different languages so yeah, yeah. i'm a selfishly asked like what, what what were those memories like like you know going to <laughs> ghana and going to these places and kind of building relationships with those communities and what is it like conversating with them what do they want out of the relationship as well right like yep. kind of yeah kind of know what you and the, and the, and the company wants but what, what are they at what are some of their ask and needs yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so it's it's different in kind of with each, each country, but like particularly um, India and Indonesia, I really did s- like set up all on my own from scratch. And so going there uh, in person. Um, so India, for example, was the first artisan region that we had partnered up with. So I had the the luck of getting invited to um, to teach a bag design masterclass at a university in Pune, India, in Maharashtra. It was a, a former colleague of mine at Crumpler, actually, where I designed bags for the first time in Vietnam. He was teaching at that university. And so he started a bag design masterclass, which is just a you know a couple week program. And I was invited to teach that with uh, um, two or three other people. And so I had my, my plane ticket paid for, and it happened to be at the same time that I was ideating on <laughs> Ethnotech and what it could be. And I actually had a sample in hand nice. for it. So I, you know, used all of my vacation days left at the job that I had so that I could teach, but then also have some extra time afterwards to go on my own and then visit the artisans. And so then I, I took a plane and then a train and then a bumpy bus ride to Gujarat State, um, to the city of Buj. And then uh, I had researched there's a lot of artisan communities, uh, lots of different textiles and, and a lot of villages supporting the, that craft in the area. And so just went to the guest house, asked the host at the guest house um, if he knew anyone and they did. And then of course I, I had some contacts based on my research uh, of people um, spearheading projects there. They didn't know I was coming. So I just kind of knocked on the door and said, Hey, I'm Jake. And uh, this is what I'm, these are the people I'm hoping to meet. And can you help me out? And uh, everyone was super 
super positive and more than happy to oblige and help me out. And so they made some introductions. Uh, usually it's the case where I tell them what I'm after and then they'd bring me to like a souvenir shop and like, yes, you can buy the fabric from here. I'm like, no, 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 I, I want to, I, I hope to purchase textiles in large quantities every quarter or for many years to come. And if, if, if you want, and if we have your permission, tell your cultural story um, because the brand is also all about, you know, cultural awareness and celebrating diversity and not, not just making cool, colorful products and hiding behind uh, the kind of do good aspect of helping the artisans. It's it's really about how can we facilitate taking traditional craft and culture into a modern context. And so once they understood that they, this could be a long term sustainable thing, and that you know, okay, we trust this guy; he has good intentions. Let's let's see how it goes. It changes from you know taking taking me to a tourist shop to meeting their cousins, uncles, families, right, um, right, that right. sort of thing. And then so then it's all about uh, establishing a relationship, you know, having food together, having laughs together, and then not talking business really until, you know, right. the last few days of the trip. And so, yeah, I did that in India and it was a very similar process in Indonesia as well. Ghana, we had connected with our supplier there via Alibaba of all places. And, and so then we'd been talking over the years and sending things electronically and then eventually went there to meet him years after we actually had been doing work together. And Guatemala, same thing, found someone online and just got started and then eventually got more and more involved in our own way uh, over time. And in Vietnam, our, you know, the production manager, a friend of mine that I just just mentioned, Mr. I is his name. Uh, he, he, he facilitates all of the textile sourcing there. So, you know, we lived there for many years and we would go visit them um, together and he would be the facilitator and translator, which pretty much always is needed. I think, uh, Ghana is probably the only place where, yeah, we have a facilitator there too, but, and, and he speaks great English and um, we didn't have too much trouble there thanks to him. And so, yeah, you have to adapt, but it always helps having someone that is based there that has connections that is business savvy, but also understands the, the traditional artisan textile process and the culture behind it so that, you know, we, they can make sure we're treading lightly. And so someone that speaks both languages, right? Like the artisan side and also the business side, because right. we need to be able to, you know, communicate with someone after we leave it, like it's not practical to go there every month, every year. So communicating with someone that, you know, checks their email every day that has experience in shipping things via air freight and sea freight and there's a whole bunch of logistics and so it's 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 uh, rare to find these individuals but they're they're around you know and it's it's usually the kind of the younger generations uh the entrepreneurs the hungry ones that are um keen that have the same values so we would find uh people in each place i don't know serendipitously or if it's just the way that it is but a lot of people looking to do the exact same thing you know like they uh, want to continue their families and their and their culture's craft and are looking for new ways to do it and new business opportunities to do it um, because you can do good while doing well. And we all understand that. And so finding people that share the same values, I think is is crucial. And so we did that. It takes a while. Um, a lot of, you know, misunderstandings along the way, but that's part of the adventure and the excitement of, you know, parachuting into some place without, you know, with the plan, but also not knowing what the hell is going to even happen. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned sort of culture, right? And, and community over the last decade, what have you learned about different cultures and the communities have what are some of the things you take away from from those cultures, right? That you appreciate, or you you want to implement them sort of in your in your own life, or like what if you sort of learn from the artisans themselves and the cultures and communities that they come from? That's a really good question. There's so many ways to answer that too. Probably one of one of many that stand out is is to slow down. Do I guess due to the nature of the the textile process itself, you know, it's. It's something that takes time. It's something that takes love and takes uh, extreme attention to detail. And a lot of these craftspeople that that do this, it kind of seems to like, no pun intended, weave into their whole daily life in terms of the rhythm of how, in which to live, but also, you know, what's what's important. And so being a an anxious person going from my um, kind of fast paced stressy American career-driven lifestyle to a weaving village where it's 
right like the opposite of that it, it's a totally different vibe and 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 it yeah slowing down it's something that i struggle with but it's but once you once you're able to uh <laughs> at least at least practice it most of the time it makes a huge difference and asking questions so not going in and just saying we want to do this we have all these all these ideas but starting with you know what 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 do you think and um what's important to you and how how do how do you do this and what does that mean and what is this color and who are these people and how long does that take and so slowing down and asking questions i think uh, are, are are more on the practical kind of lifestyle as it relates to the work side of things but but then on on the cultural like tradition side of things it's just awe inspiring being connected to kind of the the religion associated and the spiritual beliefs associated with the textiles and how they weave a lot of these things that they see in daily life into the textiles as well you know i i, I feel privileged and honored to be around it and you know learning about Hinduism and animism and food and about, you know, their individual philosophies and seeing how they are with their families. Um, it's just all so beautiful uh, to be around. And, and it, it just makes me feel grateful. And, you know, when I do get stressed out in my job or, you know, and, and stateside or even here for that matter, it, it's a check for me um, because I, I, I was there and I know what it can be like and they're teaching me. And also it helps remember like why we're doing this in the first place and who we have on our side. And it's, it's you know, they're, they're our business partners, you know, it's a trade yeah. relationship. It's not it's not like us helping the poor defenseless artisans. They're entrepreneurs too. And like my job is just to, is to br help bridge the gap, you know, get, get their incredible artwork onto our products and connect the end customers so that we can keep investing in their, their craft and the culture that's literally woven into it. So long-winded answer. I don't know if it answered it, but <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great, man. That's great. Uh, I, I want to touch on uh, two more things here but before we before we wrap it up. W one would yeah. be we kind of touched on a, a little bit earlier, but I kind of want to maybe get another long winded answer from you, and that's sort of sure. being ten years, you know, in a company and started from scratch. And you know, I'm always inspired of looking at lessons learned and advice I could take from you know, from other individuals and, and I hope other other people like that as well. So I, I, I kind of just want to get, you know, your advice for maybe future social entrepreneurs or impact entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general who want to get started or, or maybe they're at a company like you were, right? But they have plans on starting something, right? And they kind of need, you know, a little bit of a roadmap to do so. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it's much different now, obviously, 10 years ago, there's different ways you can get started now, right? There, there might be might be quicker yeah. ways, it might be better or worse ways, I, you know, we're not sure. But if you were, you know, 10 years ago, if you were about to sort of start Ethnotech, right, in 2021, what do you think some of the steps would be for you to take now, maybe versus back then? Yeah, really good question. And that's, and that's kind of why I want um, wanted to reach out to you and have a conversation um, because it's something I want to speak more to in general because you know I can only be so effective behind my laptop all day every day. And I definitely want to encourage other social entrepreneurs, young, old, new, whatever, um, to, to do what we do, because, you know, from the bottom up, you know, we can change, we can change the industry together. Um, there's a lot of corporations running rampant, and there's a lot of, there's a lot going on in the online culture right now that I believe is quite toxic and attacking small to medium sized social entrepreneurs and businesses that do good because you know the second you say you're doing something good you open yourself up for scrutiny while some sure. of these other companies that aren't sure. mission driven aren't receiving any criticism yeah, it's and crazy. so i i think yeah. in today's climate like i've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs that are scared to start a business because of the criticism and getting canceled and their reputation uh, getting berated and all of these things. And so, you know, that, you know, I can't speak to how to heal the culture online because of how toxic it, toxic it is, but I can speak to how to start the right way. And so I think it, you can head all these things off at the past by, by making a good plan. And, and uh, so we just published our, our internal ethical sourcing guidebook which we call the, mm. the sourcing roadmap wow. um and so you know we 
we've been over 10 years in, in what we do. And so, you know, our experience is in textiles and, you know, it, it can translate to many different uh, industries and supply chains as well. Yeah. So I would say start with a plan, a plan for not just how, just not just making the thing, because often, oftentimes making the thing is the easy part. So it's, it's how, how to make the thing who is going to be involved and how you tell the story once you bring it to market. So what happens on the back end and on the front end is pretty critical, I think, for for at least social enterprises who are advertising uh, the good that they do, because you got to be as transparent as possible. And uh, you also got to be careful not to be, you know, making claims that aren't true to your values and what you actually do. So you don't right. want to be virtue right. signaling. You don't want to be doing any of any of that nasty stuff. And the, and it all starts with a plan, you know, like really looking at every aspect of the supply chain and seeing where your values fit within that and making sure that you really are doing the the, the best possible good all the way up until the finished product. And that's simple, you know, like communication is, is easy these days. So just ask all of your partners, is this cool? Um, what would you prefer? Um, you know, what are the limitations? Uh, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of things that you can put in place to um, essentially make your mission bulletproof, but you got to do that from the beginning. And so that's why we published our sourcing roadmap is that hopefully so other people who want to work with artisans, especially as it relates to textiles can do it right. And I, I don't say that we're experts in this area, but you know, we've been doing it for a while and it, it's, it's, been working and the, all of our partners are pretty happy and 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 uh, we all love what we do and you know we have nothing to hide and I wouldn't do it any other way and so uh, at this point it's like getting the story out more and using the right tone in which to speak about what it is that you do and so I would say uh, yeah start with the plan um, and, and 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 ask questions go slow ask questions to all of your um, partners that you run the business with and reach out to your favorite brands. You never know who's going to respond to your email or answer your phone call and, and give some advice. And so, so just keep, keep pushing, you know, like I, I get emails all the time from people starting up and I, I don't have time to get to all of them, um, especially on time, but I, but I try my best to, to, um, to help where I can. And so, yeah, reach out, don't do it in a vacuum um, because usually that can lead um, to some, um, some problems. So collaborate, be open, don't be afraid to make mistakes and definitely be careful about how you set it up and also how you release it into the world and, and don't be scared. And so I think if there's, as long as there's a good, good plan behind it and you involve some people with experience in it, then you are set free to do what you're passionate about. And that's, that's ultimately what needs to happen. That's the end result of having a good plan, not just the product that you release onto the world, but you, what, what you, how you are, how, what's your state of being when you release it to the world? Because at the end of the day, if your passion and enthusiasm is alive and not strained or squashed or suppressed in any way, that's going to translate. And that's going to lead to really good things for not only you, but for your business and all the, the partners that help you elevate the business the way that it is. So I guess that's what I would say. <laughs> that's amazing, man. <laughs> the, the, the other thing I wanted to do, because I, I remember really liking this about you guys early on and, and it's one thing i think is it is, is it can be important is that start with one product too right i mean you don't have to have yeah, exactly. a massive product line right like look at the market like can you do one single product really 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 well right and then start yep. there yep. and then if you do that exactly. well eventually you can have more in your product line just like you did right you started with one bag right and now yep. you have yep. a plethora of, of product lines so yep. i just thought yep. that was a, a great way to move and i think sometimes people when they start they think they have to do everything up front and have you know six products out the gate and, and have this elusive thing and like this big mega thing it's like just start so small you know do one yep. thing incredibly yep. well you know and that's how you get customers to support you because you make amazing high quality this one thing right and then you can yep. start slowly moving into to another product exactly yep that's 100 percent right and i love that you know that about us <laughs> that's like true testament that you've been uh supporting us from the get beginning and and uh big thanks to what you do man like you are you've dedicated most of your time to serving uh, social entrepreneurs and you know impact investment and all the good things that are you know people are you know, working their butts off to do, you know, something positive in the world and kudos to what you do, man. I think that that's, that's really amazing. 
I'll end on one last question would yeah. be um, the future, right? And it's kind of, you know, difficult for everybody to kind of look at what three to five years down the road looks like. But just from Ethnotech point of view, like what, what are some of the successes and goals? Maybe, you know, when you sit down and, <laughs> you know, write out sort of long-term goals or just annual goals, like what are some of the successes you want to see within the next few years? Is it get, is it going to more countries, getting more artisans, or is it just keeping the relationships with the current artists and just sort of growing that relationship and, and that, you know, culture and community together and just building out the ethnotech customer base uh, through the storytelling that you've been doing for, for a decade now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because we, we actually do have a good foundation now because we, we just, every year we like to publish some sort of report on the impact that we do. Usually it's, you know, to our newsletter subscribers um, because those, those are customers we want to want them to feel good about, you know, their, what their purchase uh, does. And now we're, we're publicizing it a bit more. And so we just recently published our impact report. So that, that's a really cool place to start because uh, in doing the math of it all, it was pretty fun because, uh, and, and the statistic that I like the most is the total life to date uh, meters of fabric that we've made in collaboration with all of our artisan countries. And that's uh, 60,000 meters. I think it's something around 60,219 or so, uh, which equates to six Mount Everest stacked vertically. When I look at stuff like that, I'm like, all right, dude, like your problems, it's okay. Like it's you, you, this is not an art project. You know, we're all doing this together and, and I can't take credit for that. Right. Like it's, it's our customers that make that happen. And so that taking that metric right there. So this is like 200 artisans across five countries that are creating textiles in collaboration with Ethnotech on an annual basis. And however long it takes, I, I want to 10 X that. So I want to take that to those 200 artisans and multiply that to 2000 artisans, because the ones we work with currently, they have the ability to scale. Like they're, they're hungry for more work and they have, you know, they, they, they know how to collaborate and there's no competition going on there. You know, like they, they just want to keep this thing going and they don't protect their, you know, specific motifs. They're happy to teach those to other weavers to keep, to keep the good thing going. So I think it's possible. So 10 xing our goal to 2000 artisans weaving full-time uh, batik embroidery full-time per year. And I would also like to add a new artisan sourcing region every other year. I would prefer every year, but I think logistically that's probably a bit difficult to do, but a, you know, a new country or a new village or new technique and process uh, every other year, which I think is achievable and it keeps it exciting and it keeps, you know, it gives, gives um, something to look forward to for existing customers and, and future customers. So that's my ideal goal as it relates to, um, you know, the, the artist side of things from a product development standpoint, Oh man, I don't know. So much is changing these days so fast. Um, like what, it, what is the future of travel and, you know, what kind of, what kinds of things are people going to be carrying? Because, you know, ultimately that's what we do. We design bags for, for people to carry their stuff. And so looking at micro travel, local travel, mindful travel, um, I think that, you know, cameras are getting smaller. There's, there's a lot going on with technology that will influence the bags that we design. So I can't really even answer that um, from a product standpoint. So for me, it's always the core, the mission, and you know the impact that we create through the products we design. But yeah, I think uh, as as you know, more and more people are shopping online, and I think during during a COVID world, a lot of people are at home, and I think rethinking their purchase uh, their purchasing cycle their consumption habits and I, and I think that uh, a lot of habits are going to change for the better um, once people once we're able to you know get on top of this thing back out into society and traveling and, and going back to whatever life will look like as as that happens and I think that there's more and more people looking to ethical brands now than ever and so I think that that's something that's really exciting so I think that competition is no longer a thing I think that the the opportunity for collaboration with other brands to co-create co totally agree totally agree love you it you know come together and maximize the good but also create you know amazing things and 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 incredible projects that bring people together um and so i i see a huge opportunity in that and so my goal is just to be a part of that and and help uh, as many people as we can along the way amazing my brother thank you so much for for taking the time 
and uh Absolutely. it's been it's been awesome to to watch the to watch the journey man and listen it's uh, a lot of businesses in general don't last this long right so it, it's kudos yeah. to to you and sort of the team and just keep plugging away you know and that, that's yeah, the thing Longe- longevity is so hard to do <laughs> you know yes, and yes. it's uh it, it's a great you know testament to your customers as well right and, and to the consumers that have I've really, you know, supported you guys along the way. And, and so hopefully that obviously continues to happen. It continues to grow, but cheer, cheers to the next decade, man. And, and best of luck going forward. 